Hey there. Hey. How are you? Hey. Can you hear me okay? Hey. Good. What's How going are you? On? I can. Hold on. Hold on for one second, guys. I have it. It's a feedback out here. Mr. Too. Wayne, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing today? You know, I'm ready and excited about the rest of the day, but tomorrow and Wednesday are going to be really crappy. Uh, why is that? Uh, we are expecting rain and, and ice and snow, and nobody has a clue as to how much. Wow. The, the range has gone from 3 inches to 30. We were, remember I was remember there, you know, as you know, see, I just came back from Palm, Palm Springs. Palm I got all kind of sun. Well, is it that one? He got kicked off. So you got to let him okay. back in. Oh, okay. How's everything going? Oh man, why can't I hear you? Can, can you hear me now? Can you, okay, yeah, I was just telling. Yeah, now I can. I know. I was sorry, I was on my screen. I can't hear you. I just anymore. got back from uh, Palm Springs and I got all kind of sun. So yeah, it was it was really it was really sunny out there. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, uh, oh, out where Co Coachella is at. And where I was out, I actually drove, went, oh, was in Coachella Valley last night. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know Coachella was the city. Yeah. In a big part of land. It's a big valley. That. Yeah. Yeah. So I was out that way last night. We actually, there was an after party out there last night that we were supposed to go to, but a uh, event, actually, after event. And uh, we ended up, it was just too late. We had to come back. Yeah. So we didn't make it. Are you saying that Coachella music is on? It ended yesterday, and then they had a, a, an event after, you know, just a, uh, a special event yesterday. And I was supposed to go, but uh, we ended up not going. Shows you how into it I am. <laughs> me, look, I wouldn't normally do anything like that. Like, that's a lot for me. All those young people look at me and go, what are you here for? The same. same. Why are you there? <laughs> He got kicked off again, and he has a lot of feedback on his end, so it may, that may be the reason. He, he might have I know, two devices I on, know. like his computer, his own, and his, his phone, maybe. Yeah, let me see what's going on. Yeah, Because he has has the has the yeah. volume down for one of them. Muted. Both of them. He's got to have a muted. Yeah, you have to mute it. Yeah. So let's see who's on here. Hi, Timothy. How are you? Thanks for joining. We're going to start in just a moment. Just some technical difficulties. You guys know how it is by. Um, working from home on on this phone. I really wish uh, Instagram yeah. would let us use our computers. It's not happen. I don't know why. So anyway, you know, I'll tell you guys, I am about to do um, a book signing. I did one 
last week. I actually sold several copies of the magazine. I'm so excited because pe people were like buying the magazine and subscriptions like crazy. That's and so I was dope. like, woo, yes, yes. Uh huh. So, um, it was really great. Um, I was at the Indiana State University last uh, weekend, uh, Dr. Whiteman, I was telling Wayne, and um, we sold like several magazines. People were buying the subscriptions and I've been invited to do another um, event on May 13th where I'm gonna uh, sell more subscriptions. Many nice. of the books on the website sold out. <laughs> and you know, the, the same books keep selling out the anxiety for kids yeah. and mindfulness meditation for beginners um sells out and then i have a new author um that's going to be with us in two weeks that's kind of come on and talk about his book and um his book sold out the first day that i well only had one <laughs> somebody bought the one because i want to see how i'm going to sell and so now that's added to the bookstore and we have other books that are added to the bookstore as well from authors mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. um, everything is around mental health, that focus, um, uh, toward gear, gear toward, um, coping skills, developing coping skills around anxiety and spreading awareness around different illnesses. So, um, I, I love it. Hear me okay? I love it. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's where No, I, I just, Was it, did you have something else? Turn on? some things down so we don't get any feedback and it won't bump my connection off. Okay, well, uh, let's get started. Um, everyone, my name is Dr. Leslie Rogers. I am the owner of Mental Health Talk LLC and its projects. The most uh, prominent one is the Mental Health Talk magazine that I was just talking to is my pride and joy. And um, all of us on this uh, platform is a part of it and it is growing really rapidly. Um, and I was just saying that I was at an event a couple weeks ago where the magazine was selling. Not only was the magazine selling, I sold like, 10 hmm. subscriptions in two hours mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so that was like pretty good and i have another event i'm going to um on the 13th where i anticipate uh they're going to sell out even more so and then our next issue is about to drop it's about to come out um allison williams r b artist uh, performing artist is going to be uh the cover feature and she is going to talk about her relationship mm -hmm. with Phyllis Hyman, the late, great Phyllis mm -hmm. Hyman, um, who committed suicide some years back. So, um, you know, stay tuned for that magazine that's going to come out. It's going to be um, great information. Um, and we have a lot of other stuff in there as well. So um, on here, we have Wayne Lassane, who's also um, working to get a certification um, in counseling. And he's doing great things. Um, he and his wife, and he has his own uh, practice going on now, and I'm so proud of him. And then we have Dr. Uh, Lowell Whiteman, who's with 360 Mindset and um, a performance coach for elite athletes. And today we're going to continue talking about that um, line between anxiety and PTSD, where it pertains to athletes, uh, performance, performance and um, elite athletes and um dr lowell he's going to take the round today and we're going to follow his well lead. thank you leslie you i really appreciate floor, that and wayne it's good to see you as always oh, yeah. um and, and and both of you i'm envious of because you have way more hair than me so it's just you can do more things you can you know style <laughs> and this is it's very frustrating never mind I, I won't go there it's just it makes me a little bit the clamped just, you know, just, you know. so i'm just, okay. I'm just starting with a little it's anxiety okay. because that's part of what we're talking about. You know, yeah. it's, it's not it's not post traumatic syndrome based disorder, but it's it's, it's traumatic. Yes. Uh, but I wanted I wanted to get, go a little further into details about what we've talked about uh, regarding PTSD, the anxieties um, associated with that as it relates to athletes, but in, in the form of looking at the the triggers and coping mechanisms that athletes. Um, oftentimes aren't made aware of. They, they just aren't given enough information because that doesn't make any money. <laughs> that, that doesn't exactly. give the team or the athlete any more uh, leverage with their sponsors or the franchise or the college for that matter, which is a whole other thing coming down our, our uh, highway of uh, athletics is what's going on with colleges and um, new changes with the NCAA as it relates to money pressures 
performance towards money or value are some of the things that trigger uh, young people, whether they're a pro or an amateur. So there's a whole different kind of category of energy that um, causes the potential for anxiety to happen. But one of the one of the things that I want us to talk about and consider today is what <laughs> what strategies do coaches and athletes use to mitigate the onset of an anxious behavior that it could be a trauma-based anxiety or it may not be. But what's interesting to, to me is, is how much camouflaging goes on with the organizations, administrations, and coaching staffs with athletes that now they're starting to come out. The athletes themselves are starting to say, look, it, I can't wait for you. I'm in the midst of something here. I need to deal with this right now. Stop trying to push it away, camouflage it, disguise it, and, and make, it, make it sound like it's okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off with some quotes to kind of set us up for the discussion about triggers and coping mechanisms to maintain that um, mental condition that helps you perform at your best, but at the same time try to understand when they show up. The better we can anticipate what might trigger you and then quickly have yourself or a structure of folks around you to bring the coping mechanisms into play so that you can resiliently come back to the playing field. Now, as I say that, I'm reminded of the story of someone who says, you're so mean, Dr. Wyman, you're so mean. I go, what are you talking about? I just helped your, your, your daughter get back to the court. Well, that's exactly why you're so mean. She needs to rest. She needs to take care of herself. I said, well, we've handled, in this case, we handled the trigger. We got into the coping strategies. We did it quickly. And remember, you're still dealing with a competitor. Yeah. Somebody who wants to get back into the play quickly. Simone Biles is one of those that uh, comes to mind. Uh, and God rest his soul, Kobe Bryant is another one. And a quote from Kobe fits right in here with that. He said, before any big game, I like to take time to visualize myself performing at my best. He says, I've, it, it, it feels to him that it helps to calm his nerve and focus his energy on the tasks at hand. Now, remember, that's a comment of an individual self-medicating, if you will, in a metaphorical sense. But he's taking charge of what he needs to do. Not someone else, not mom or dad, not his wife or his coach. He's taking charge of it. The same way uh, Simone Biles did for a, a long time until um, an event with the Olympics overwhelmed her. And she needed uh, the support to uh, generate the coping mechanisms into the environment. And she's a, a good example of that happening. Her, her team knew what was going on. They knew she had this vertigo like syndrome where she would lose where she's at like most of us will anyway but <laughs> spinning in the air <laughs> with multiple twists and she would lose where she's at and that would be possibly threatening to her physically yeah. but her team knew that um but naomi osana that's a different story a tennis player she didn't have people around her to support her and and help her get through the, the big match or, uh, or get through the, the loss of a big match um, uh, because the press took charge of her and said, no, the rules are this. You need to go to the interviews. And they didn't give her uh, any pathway of, of coping behaviors to address those triggers. And the triggers were many times not what fits into the clinical definition of a, of combating traumatic situations or emotional situations that escalate themselves. And her, her triggers were the one, the first one was she lost the match. She should have won. She was the more talented player in the Australian open. And the second thing that happened was the, the rules that caused her to feel confined and closed in the rule being you have to go to the press after the match and, and take the questions. And, <laughs> press didn't even let her get to the press room before they started asking her questions. And that, that 
but then the environment was just not conducive. So one of the coping mechanisms that I want to start off with is, what do you feel like when the environment's not a good fit? <laughs> How does that influence your ability to cope and adapt and adjust and, and generate resilient behaviors to get yourself at least have the choice yeah. to get back into the arena of competition whenever you feel that's appropriate? So that's my first question to you all is, is about those competitive uh, scenarios and how, how impactful environment is with not only helping you see the triggers come in advance and prepare yourself physically and emotionally, but then if they, it overwhelms you and, and grabs you, um, and I mean that, again, metaphorically, not literally, uh, how does that environment, that physical structures, the, the people in the room, how does that affect how we can uh, resiliently get to a good place and not just sit there and, and, and linger in anguish? Right. Wayne, when you answer that question, um, uh, when, before you go into solutions, can you talk about the emotions felt first when you, um, yeah. just to kind of normalize well, those? I, I feel like when I, when I hear that, when I think about it is that, you know, like, like it would in, be in that space that doesn't feel, you know, good to you like that. You can't even be present fully, you know, like, like you already, you're not even in your, you're more in your head than you are in your body and, and where you should be and be focused. Like it would be so hard to, to focus and perform at whatever level you need to perform at or show up how you need to show up because you can't even be present, you know, because, because of what you're already feeling. And that in itself starts to make you start to go off onto so many different other thoughts, which gets you further and further away from where you want to be at. And right. So, so how do you now get back into that, into your body, into that space? Like that's, that's the question. Like how, how what do you do in those times that, that to get you, help you come back from where you are? But when you, you lose your sense of self, then what do you feel? Is, oh, that, is that like anxious oh, or yeah, anger? A, a lot of what anxiety. Is it that, a what lot is it of anxiety. Feeling? You start to feel anxious. You start to feel like, I'm, I'm sure feelings of alone come up and, and you know, and, and, you know, and, and, you know, just feeling like, like um, nobody's understanding and, 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 and start panic possibly, you know, cause panic attacks, you know, uh, well, and, and you bring on panic attack because just of all these feelings that start to spiral because you're trying to, you know, you don't know how to, to get back, you know, if you don't know how. And, and Leslie, to your question, the energy in the, I'll, I'll call it room, it could be a court, a gym, a field. It also could be a room. The energy in that space is palpable. Um, and, yes. and, and with the individual that I've talked to in many cases, they actually feel it on their skin. Like their hair is rising. You know, like, ever heard the phrase, the hair in the back of my neck was up and I was so angry. You know, those kind of things are real, tangible feelings. And, and so it, it, many times they don't come out with the word anger or, or uh, fear or both, they come out with just a loud voice. There's, there's a lot of animation to the energy that they're feeling in that moment. And until they can bring them, get, get some coping strategies put in place with people around, like uh, one of the things I discovered in, in my uh, historic, my files, uh, Serena Williams back in 2018, she got into an argument. I mean, a classic historical point in time where she um, just started ripping into the, the judge, the, the center judge. And, and, and it was justified. There was nobody after the fact that didn't say she wasn't justified. But the, the fact that she was being dismissed, a woman of color, a woman of that level of skill in that incident, just launched her into a place that in the moment, nobody knew exactly where she was going in her mind. They all thought it was about tennis. And it, it went to so many different places. Uh, her influence of her dad and how he had trained and educated her about the business of tennis at the pro level and the business of interacting as a young uh, woman of color um, at the level of expertise she had. So many things going on in her head. So the energy was a, is a big thing for me to answer your question about the feelings. It is, it is palpable and, and you can get a feeling of cramp, like your muscles are so tight that you just, you could, 
you could get rigid to the point of not being able to relax. That's how yeah. far I've seen some athletes yeah. go with their, yeah. with their anger. Yeah. Um, I've had a, had a, a football player break a mask on his helmet. He was squeezing it, pushing it together so hard and was so uh, amped up with adrenaline. He just bent the mask into itself. Um, and that in itself was kind of a coping mechanism. I, I use physical alternatives and yeah. redirects uh, for a lot of people. So I, <laughs> in my office, when I had an office, I used to carry 16 ounce, 16 ounce boxing gloves. They were in my desk drawer. And I, have, I did a survey, um, not a survey, a polling of how many, to, how, how many times women versus men picked up the gloves when they were angry, anxious, frustrated, whatever. And the women outweighed the men. They, they picked up the 16 ounce gloves more often than the men did. And the, if they picked them up, they had to punch the desk. I had a really beat up old desk and they had to punch the desk just to get rid of that energy. Yeah. You, you know, you bring up a good point when you talk about energy. And I think that just side note that I think that people don't understand, you know, your 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 skin is the biggest organ on your body. And it's and it's full of receptors. And you can start to receive other people's energy as well. So somebody can walk in a room who have a lot of anxiety now, you start to take that anxiety on. Somebody walks in a room and has a lot of they, they start you can the anxious feeling or fear or whatever it is, you take on that energy. So now it becomes contagious throughout the room, you know, and now, now again, it's just, and we have, and again, it's just, just being conscious of these things that can happen, you know? So I thought it was a great point you brought about energy because I completely agree with that. Well, and I, I think it has a basis that, that feeling uh, and the energy has a basis for re, reshaping our definition of the word trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked like, last time about how we people see events or they watch film or they watch a video and they can get into a traumatic situation just by being seeing that right and being close enough physically as well as seeing it but there's also the the interactions with people when the energy is so amped up and you, you've been challenged like she was challenged by this judge mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I would I would challenge anybody to tell me that's not a traumatic event for Serena Williams in the moment right um, because she, she has a physical <laughs> repercussions if you will because yes. of that event the level of energy um i have firefighters and police officers that give me similar stories about um the the fact that they were in the scene the mm -hmm. energy was up you know multiple car crash was one example uh with police officers it was a, a multiple homicide and and the place was still active with gunfire uh when they arrived so the whole energy was there to begin with, and then it went down to another level of calm, but you see all these bodies around. Yeah. And so you, you get visual stimulation that enhances the trauma and the traumatic situation um, with the foundation being that strong amount of energy because it can have some physical consequences. Yeah, and I will say that, you know, when we're talking about PTSD from a clinical standpoint, again, um, a lot of events can be seen as being traumatic. However, for a diagnosis of PTSD, it has to continue to impact yeah. your life chronically going forward, right? Um, so I want to make sure that that's clear because um, even, you know, you can look at stuff on the TV and a lot of stuff happened on the news that we can, you know, sometimes, you know, I had to stop watching the news for a little bit when they was having the, um, the, um, shootings of the black men by police yeah. officers i had to just turn the news off because it's so detrimental to me um and it was causing anxiety mm -hmm. because i have a son right um however you know i didn't meet the criteria for ptsd i was able to you know put in support such as turn the tv off or mm -hmm. you know do um self-care kind of like but when you th think about persons that don't readily have um, appropriate coping skills available to manage um, um, anxiety triggering events or um, uh, traumatic events, you know, then that's when the, uh, the uh, symptoms can potentially spiral out of control and interrupt your day to day living. And that's one of the diagnoses, the criteria for diagnoses is it causes clinically significant impairment and mm -hmm. functioning in day to day. Well, and I think that's a, it's, a, it's a great point, um, Leslie, and I, I, I like the fact that you're the one that brings it up because it, it's come from a good place, making sure that we stay really well defined on the clinical separation when the 
boundary is not clear. Uh, but once again, it, it tells us that the preemptive strategies we use in first identifying what your triggers are, identifying the coping me mechanisms that match up to that, we won't get to a PTSD state, <laughs> thankfully. But you know what else it tells you, Lo, um, is that uh, people de define mm -hmm. traumatic events oh, yeah. differently. It's different for everyone. And, and it's not only different for everyone, it's um, contingent upon like what yeah. field you're in, you know, what area you're in. Like when we were talking about this, are we talking about like, um, uh, you know, sports, athletes versus um others you know the presentations are different you know what you guys might say um uh, is traumatic and remember that's why yeah. i was asking those questions last week um as to um you know how is that considered a traumatic incident because what you guys might see as being traumatic right. everyone else might yeah. not, not see as being traumatic and that's why i think that it's so difficult sometimes when you talk about naomi and um, uh, the other female, when you talk yep. about them, um, Simone Bowles, you know, it's so, I think it's challenging for society or the world to wrap their heads yeah. around, yeah. oh, yeah. they're hurting. Yeah. They're, you know, they're, go they're going through a, um, a mental crises, right? Because they see them as being these strong individuals. And sometimes it's hard to separate mentally separate a strong individual for i mean people look mm. at me and say oh dr rogers is strong you know they probably mm. don't ever think that i have moments where i break down right because what they see is me on social media or in this form right mm. they don't see me in my private life right so it's kind of hard to kind of separate or differentiate between what's genuine mm -hmm. right what's genuine um, uh, symptomatology yeah. and what's not genuine. And I think that's where um, you had the um, negative um, feedback when, and it was horrible, the negative feedback towards those two young ladies about their mental health yeah. because they just didn't understand. They didn't I, I think to your point, you know, like just that trauma can be different for everybody. If somebody was abused as a child and they're out, they could be out in the grocery store and see someone yelling at their child, they can trigger something in them that other people may not feel as is is trauma based, but it completely is because of because something they're going there now being able to identify with from a childhood, from their own childhood, and they see it happening somewhere else. You know, I you know I can see it and be like, oh man, she's disciplining her child, but somebody else can have a real emotional reaction to that because of what they've been through in their life. So I completely agree that trauma is different for everybody. It just depends on again your life and, and your life experiences and what you've been through and how you see things. You know, so yeah. I'm loving what we're talking about here because it's it's a great framework for uh, clinicians and therapists to look at and, and taking their time because there's so many parts and the parts are different for different occupations, different considerations. You know, the, 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 the lifestyle you had at one point where you see something on the street and it triggers you. So there's, there's a great lesson here on how to ask really good questions. Yes. Be really diligent in your profiling of, of clients, whether it's an athlete, a firefighter, a, a military person, whoever it might be, before you, you go too quickly in making a judgment uh, or a decision about the condition of the, the emotional state of someone. Because yes. there's so, so many layers that uh, we have to contend with um, in, in our our, in our cultures globally, this isn't just United, you know, national here in the United States. There's so many different stimuluses that can launch people into. I mean, I think we all three of us know that if, if a certain sound claps the air with a noise, that could cause men and women on the streets to go to their stomachs yeah. <laughs> because they think it's, you know, it's, it represents a, an explosion or a gunfire yeah. or any number of things. Mm. Um, I, I know with, uh, I was recently talking to some people about uh, abuses, um, mm -hmm. uh, emotional and physical abuses, and uh, abused women uh, in the shelters, they go through a lot of training with their staffs about make sure you don't make any quick movements, make sure you don't get too close by walking up behind somebody, because they're all very skittish about sudden body movements representing someone trying to hit them or mm -hmm. hurt them. Uh, in a traumatic physical way and so it, it's taking time to really think about what <laughs> what the, going back to 
my earlier point about the mom I said about getting her daughter back into the, the fight, it's breaking those down so that yeah. you understand the capability of resiliency to bring someone back to a, a, a calm place. So the, the, the next question I had for me uh, is really Just really quick, I, I just want to, because I, I thought yeah. you touched on something that was really important. I think that, you know, the, the, the average person walks around, everybody want to feel like they could be a therapist. Everybody want to feel like they, they can therapize people, they can help people. And I think that what you said was very important, that, that curiosity part become very curious because they teach you because we can all jump to assumptions because because of our own life experience everybody want to jump to assumptions they want to they want to they want to diagnose people and say they this and they have no idea because they didn't they weren't curious enough to ask all the questions to kind of figure out what was really going on and so it's quick to say oh you're this or you're that and it's and it's not none of them right right it's because we haven't been trained to be curious enough to ask the questions and, and that's that's what separates somebody i believe is can really who's really out here doing the work and helping people opposed to somebody who's just out here kind of like thinking they're doing they're doing more damage than they are doing uh help you know? yeah and you know that um a lot of times uh, people feel uncomfortable with asking questions especially yeah. when you're talking about suicide you know i remember i used to do training when i was at the fbi and i used to say you know just come out and ask have you thought about killing yourself but you know how that makes people feel uncomfortable? How many people feel uncomfortable with asking that question? Have you thought about? So as opposed to asking, have you thought about killing yourself? They yes. may beat around and say, are you okay? You know, or, you know, ask a, um, a passive question as opposed to getting directly to the mm -hmm. point. Have you thought about killing yourself? And there's some instances where mm -hmm. you have to just be direct well, and ask the question in order yeah, to and you, you're making response. a good point that we can we can ask direct questions that are staged to the ultimate answer. For example, to your point about have you thought about killing yourself could be prefaced by do you have any bruises on your body mm -hmm. that you've gotten recently? Mm -hmm. Have you got any, any open wounds on your body that you've gotten recently? Because in many cases, the precursor is people cutting themselves, physical mutilation to themselves before they actually take the big step of jumping off a building mm -hmm. um, and and or the consideration for that, but at least you get this the staged growth of questioning that is less uncomfortable, but still towards the end goal of trying to discover where's this person at emotionally. Um, right. I, I'm interested, Leslie, in what you've experienced with other therapists that you've met, met or worked with about how they've handled the Q&A kind of process and how, the difficulties of it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great question. Again, you know, we go through training and other stuff, but then we, you know, I often mm -hmm. tell people at the end of the day, we're human too. So we come with our biases, we come with our pre experiences, and we come with things of that sort. And we come with personal experiences too. So you know, okay, when I was in training, you know, it was kind of hard for me as well, to kind of um, enter into a space where I had to like separate my personal feelings from doing therapy. I mean, there were plenty of times that I was doing therapy with people where, guys, yes, it was like yeah. I was looking yeah. in a goddamn mirror, sorry. But it was like, you know, I was looking in a mirror and, you know, I had to go home and check myself like, oh my God, right? Um, because you do, um, if you're not careful, you can become yeah. enmeshed in that yeah. therapeutic process and then take it to your family. Right. So then that being said, you know, we as providers have to reflect on our very own emotions and what we're feeling so that we can kind of separate from what we're working with. If not, we can get caught up, too. Um, and a perfect way of doing that is self-reflecting on how we feel after we leave out of therapeutic um, environment. Like, um, you know, there's so many times that we see people where their experiences are similar to how we were, you know, if we grew up in abusive families or a lot of times we get into this field because <laughs> we want to help because we've yeah. been in similar situations. So we have to be careful as to not, um, um, not put our own experiences on someone else. So the best way to do that is self-reflecting on how we're feeling um, and talking to people ourselves, you know, uh, engaging in therapy ourselves. We have, um, we have consultation, right? Um, we have people that we can consult with um, to make sure that we're okay. Because if we're not okay, you guys can't be okay when you come into our room. So um, that is a great question because there's a lot of uh, 
clinicians and I tell people, you know, when you go into the therapeutic environment, not everyone are specialists. Like for instance, I don't specialize in eating disorders. So if someone comes to me with an eating disorder, I'm well aware enough to say I have to refer out because I'm not confident in that area. So being able to um, understand and be comfortable and confident within yourself to say, I'm not competent in a certain area so that you can keep people safe, right? There's a lot of psychologists and clinicians that don't work with trauma. So when you go and look for psychologists and clinicians, you need to do your due diligence and say, do you specialize in trauma? Do you specialize in kids uh, assessing ADHD? Do you specialize in um, depression? Do you specialize in anxiety? Because a lot of times, um, you know, we have different areas of specialty. Like for instance, I treat anxiety and I work with anxiety, but I've had a patient before where um, he had uh, comorbidity and so many different anxiety disorders, then it became outside of the scope that I could handle. So I had to refer him to an anxiety specialty clinic, right? And I felt confidence enough to do that. So in answer, asking that question, how we, um, how we should, how I think we should, is um, being authentic and transparent about what we can handle and what we can't handle and being um, reflective in our day-to-day -day work, doing self-care, yeah. right? Um, meditation, mindfulness exercises so that we can become aware of our body and how we're responding to different things. And, um, and then um, being open about it, like in consultation or supervision or other stuff like that. So we have outlets that we can... Um, deal with things too and overcome things. But the biggest issue is trying to, um, being mm. able to um, separate, separate our experiences from the experiences I, I, that come into based us. Based on what you've said, I, I've also noticed some of the folks that have joined us today, they've got uh, those wonderful initials DR in front of their names and, and wondering that, you know, we, we're talking about some humility here as practitioners, mm -hmm. being humble enough to recognize that mm -hmm we all have a certain amount of empathy. Mm -hmm. So we take on what we hear emotionally from the people that we assist and support, and that can fill our buckets up. And, mm. and, and I, I've been with a therapist for over five years now because of my bucket being filled up. And for me to be a, a good uh, guide and, 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 and source of information and support, I've got to make sure my bucket's below a certain level or I'm not going to be very good at delivering the nuances and the insights that I need to, to give, be, or, or I'm going to be the one going for specialized eating disorder. But, what, you, know what, <laughs> you, know what I, you know what I think is dangerous is when we um, oh, go in and forget gotcha. that we're human. Yeah. And we, you know, we go in with that yeah. hat of psychologists, as doctor, as clinician, whomever, and yeah. we forget that we're Leslie yeah. underneath. And then we go in well, and, and try that, to bottle this stuff. The word out. humility, the origin of it really, is, is yeah. human intellect. You know, it's basically thinking about you and the humanity of who you are. Mm -hmm. So to be humble, you've got, you, it's the first thing is recognizing that you are human. Um, but I, I know for me that um, practitioners that are really good at what they do and really uh, make, a, make an impression on people quickly to support their resiliency and getting them back to being that whole productive person they were before, um, before they came in to see their, uh, their, their support network, they need help. So I, I'm, I'm routinely talking to my, my colleagues in the mental health world and, and watching them and being mindful of who they are and saying, um, Wayne, do you need to go see somebody? You, know, you look, look like you've been filled up. You're a little full. Yeah. Maybe yeah. you should go visit with somebody and get, go to the beach. Yeah. <laughs> but Dr. White... And so you talk to, when you deal with athletes, elite athletes, oh. who's there for the coaches themselves? Because yeah. there were a lot, of, there were several suicides uh, coaches. Um, yeah. Was yeah. This they, year they, and last year. Look, last there, year. there are numbers. And once again, I've, I've repeated myself often enough. Um, the money causes people to hide things. And so yes. co coaches have committed suicide. Coaches have had, had emotional issues. They've taken it home. They beat up their spouses and their loved ones. They've abused substances just like what we see in all those other buckets and pockets of humanity. You know, whether it's athletes, coaches, firefighters, police officers, military personnel, um, you know, executives in very 
high level job, whatever it is, they're, they're, it's there. The more that we can, we being us and our colleagues can continue to have this dialogue, we start to we begin to discover more about what the need is. So there's great opportunity. More specializations are needed, um, especially in athletics. Uh, they've used it for years as a joke to put a staff psychologist on staff that never gets out of the office at the franchise. They don't go on the road. Now they do more now, but when mm -hmm. they first started, it was all superficial show. It mm -hmm. wasn't substantive. It wasn't uh, worthwhile. That's why I focused on Kobe's quote uh, earlier because he was one of the first. I mean, do you remember in Denver when he was uh, sued for raping that woman in, in, uh, in Estes Park? Um, and that was, that was his turning point for himself. He, he, he knew he, he needed help. He mm -hmm. needed to get his mind and body connected in a better way. Mm -hmm. And that, that caused a huge ripple yeah. effect with his colleagues and his teammates. I have another question uh, for you, and this is a follow-up from earlier that you said. Um, so you were talking about earlier about, you know, many athletes need, you know, rest. You know, this one, you were talking about the, the athlete's mm -hmm. mom who was so angry and said that you were a mean person because, of, you know, an athlete needed rest. So when do you guys determine when um, it's time for an athlete to step back or do you do like a mental assessment or what, when do you determine it's time for an athlete to step back and do some self care or to take a break or when, you know, you it's self safety uh, a priority. The, um, the mental testing I use, um, it, depending on the circumstances, I'll, but I'll use it routinely is the um, uh, concussion ther protocols. Mm -hmm. So I'll, if mm -hmm. I feel that someone has taken a, a fall, not necessarily hit their head, but the, 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 Concussion therapeutic tests are good for a lot, lot of different nerv nervous trauma. To so grab their hands, you ask them to pull back against you. If they if they if it's equal, that's a good sign. If it's unequal, they pull hard with the left and the right. Um, there are certain things I get. I look at pupils. I look at breathing rhythms. I ask them to breathe through their nose, out through their mouth, to give me some physical sense of where their their brain and body connection is. Is it still intact? Are they in control of themselves? And then from there, I go through a set of verbal cues. I give this verbal cue methodology to my athletes uh, before in, in my startup with them. So they know that if I'm at a contest and there's a problem um, and they're starting to lose it a little bit and I, I get in front of them, we're going to go through a protocol. We're going to go through a, a, a word association protocol after I do the physical stuff. Um, mm. So I, I, take it very, very seriously right. because their health and well-being in that moment is the first priority. And then after that, it's the long-term uh, uh, health situation. So I'll, I'll make sure that they see the team position after that contest. Now, that, that tennis example I gave you with that, that girl and her mom mm -hmm. went through that mm -hmm. protocol. Her mom either didn't remember or she didn't want to remember right. <laughs> that, that her daughter had gone through this training with me. Um, but she saw me go through the protocol and then told me she was angry with me after the protocol. Uh, and her daughter went back, but her daughter did the things that she was, that she needed to do to earn her way back to the court through building the confidence and, and the execution of what we did. And then we saw that we saw the physician after that, uh, the, 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 every, every major tournament has a physician on staff, uh, at the con Test. So we went and saw them, and she, they went through a more thorough um, uh, examination with her. They involved collecting fluids, and mm -hmm. I mean, because there's neural, you know, there's neural yeah. work. Year, so urine, blood, um, and I, and I'll do, <laughs> I'll make, <laughs> I'll make my athletes get on the examination table and have the doctor get out the um, the little hammer with the scraping thing on the end, the handle, you know, the handle is that little sharp thing that you scrape the arch of their foot, mm -hmm. get their reflex back. So I'll make them, make them do that to see how responsive their body, because they could be physically just flat out tired yeah. and exhausted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it sparks a question, and I'm sure people want to know this, and this is just getting just in depth into the athlete. If you have an elite, elite athlete that's performing at a high level and they're, they're a, uh, pinnacle to the team like they're very they're, they're very pivotal i mean uh, important piece of the team and so this player gets hurt or injured whatever how seriously do the, do the team take the positions 
uh, uh, advice when, in that moment, knowing that the player is playing at, at such a high level and, and they're dependent on one? Gosh, Wayne, that's such a great question. That is. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, there, it is. In the, in the over, now almost over 30 years of experience I've had, in the early years, they didn't really care much. Um, and and halftime um, was a great time to give a lot of things that nobody knew about that got athletes back, back on the court, back on the field, uh, to their detriment. Mm. But now there's more scrutinizing. As you know, you've got the little tents that pop up on the sidelines for examination because they need to maybe take off their pants or, you know, whatever. Mm. Uh, so they think. Uh, many times, the, depending on the physician, and look, at this is the extreme. It's not every team right. doesn't do this. Uh, and I can give you names of teams that if, if I was pushed, legally pushed, I could give you names of teams to do it right. But they, they don't really pay attention if, if there's any chance at all that athlete can get back on the field and generate anywhere close to what they were performing at, they're going to do it. Mm. And because they're men and women at a professional level under contract, that thought process is going through that athlete's head. And they, they will say, I've had athletes say in my presence, I have to honor this in my contract. Right. Or the other, other side is, I won't get paid any more bonus money if my number isn't on the field for another three minutes. Right. And that's how calculated they get. Hockey players yeah. on line, line changes, how many times they were in the line change. Yeah. That's, that's an economic benefit. How many times a player is on the special teams and then gets to also play on the line. They're yeah. going to get bonus money because they got into special teams and made a tackle. Yeah. Every, every action has a potential economic benefit for those athletes. So an injury that gets in the way, that's, that's not a cha-ching. Yeah, because so yeah, I, I was thinking about the money aspect of it because it's a, a money-making system. Yeah. I mean, it just goes back to an athlete, uh, Robert Griffin III, when he was on the field, injured clearly he shouldn't have been on the field but you know through the injury he had sustained but he was still on the field and I, and, it's just, and I know that all kind of questions came out about that at the time so it just maybe it prompted me to think like wow do they take the how strongly do they take the word of physician when an athlete gets injured or whatever and but to put him back on the field so thank you for answering that well two is two but here's the thing, the problem is, and that's what we were talking about, though. That's that's the problem. And that's why, especially when we talk about men suffer too and talk about the reasons why men don't come yep. forward or women or whomever, right? The reason why I don't come forward, especially when they're in these high demanding um, and high responsibility fields, because, um, you know, yeah. you feel like you let the team down. So even if you, you know, it's not all the... NFL or the uh, organization's fault, you know, I'm sure, and you said this, you alluded to this earlier, Dr. Whiteman, yep. is um, the athletes, even with this girl's mother, the athletes want to get on back on the field and do their job because they feel like depending on what position you're in, I did, you know, um, uh, their um, uh, counseling center for a university, and again, I worked with a lot of athletes and they, yes, they, they were hurt, some of them could barely walk, right? But the goal was to get back on the field or on the track or the basketball court or wherever and do their jobs because yeah. I can't let my team down, right? Um, so then it comes, you know, to supporting like your team members and um, your coaches and et cetera, supporting you to keep you well. But what's the priority? And um, Dr. Whiteman, I was reading your document and I like when you said teammates, fans, and family can play an important role and supporting an elite performer to be resilient and continue performing at their highest, at their best challenging competition. And I believe that because if you help them to get well, I would imagine that their performance would be even better. But if you put them on the uh, court or back into the field prematurely, you know, even like with the athletes that we were talking about earlier, Naoma and um, Simone, you know, you put them back prematurely, then that just sets them up yeah. for defeat or failure and um, you know, that's detrimental to mental health because then they take that failure and internalize that failure as to I'm worthless, I'm no yep. good, I'm too old or whatever those um, self-demeaning thoughts or, or their automatic thoughts that come to mind during this time. But we have to think about ways, well, 
you guys, I would imagine, uh, Coach Whiteman, is think about ways as to how you can keep athletes safe while maintaining the integrity yeah. of the game, right? And one Without of the ways I do it is, is um, giving economic information, um, energy, and purpose to the safety and well-being of the athlete. What I mean by that is the coaches, general managers, administrators, whatever college or pro, whatever one it is, will tend to come through with comments about, well, they're fine, they're fine. And, you know, yeah. somebody should turn to them and say, you're not the doctor, so just back, back off. So what I, what I do is a preface to these right. power brokers is tell them the truth, truth to power about the economics. If you continue to play them, it's going to cost you more for rehab because of the severity of the injury than it would be if you were to let them just take a breath, skip a quarter, skip a period, whatever, move on, because now they're going to be more engaged, more, more physically capable the next time, and, and continue, consistently continue to generate the income you want, but at the same time not dismember the athlete right at the expense of the athlete. Yeah. Yeah. and so you said on here um some of the ways that family mm -hmm. and loved ones and fans guys and fans i think, I think um can do a lot of harm and um with especially in today's world with, with having um, access to everybody through social media right before it was a buffer you can you didn't have access to the athletes mm -hmm. like you do today anybody can, can have access to anybody in who who has a name for themselves today because of social media. So that that's huge as you say that because I don't think that people understand the effect that they have now that they have access to these people, which you know, which is good yeah. and bad all at the same time, you know. Yeah. So in carriage, uh so what this is saying, um how how we all can support athletes is um yeah, absolutely. Is this, okay, okay, if I read before this? you read it, Leslie, okay. is that use your text, your Instagram, your Facebook to make your comments to the points that Leslie's going to make. Yeah. Yeah. So um, encourage positive feedback, encouragement and positive feedback, providing verbal and written encouragement and positive feedback. And go, we go, we go back to Simone Bowles and Naomi uh, Osaka. That feedback Wasn't that good. Um, uh, you know, yeah. the public was Wasn't giving good. them was horrible. Yeah, it was horrible. Um, and I can imagine they went home feeling had some type of you know negative feelings behind that, right? Um, emotional support, um, adding some emotional support, practical support. Emotional support is offering emotional support, such as listening to athletes' concerns, worries, um, and uh, can you help them feel understood? Like um, Practical support, providing practical support, such as helping an athlete with logistics and transportation can help reduce their stress level, celebration of success, even mm -hmm. any milestone, any whether it's small or big, celebrating yeah. the milestones, right? Um, respect of boundaries is important to uh, respect athletes' boundaries, especially during times of high stress and pressure. Um, constructive feedback, providing constructive feedback can help an athlete improve their skills and performance as long as it is given in a supportive and helpful manner, right? Um, positive team culture, um, creating a positive team culture that emphasizes support, respect, and cooperation can help athletes feel connected and motivated to work together towards their goals. And overall, the support of the teammate, fans, and family can have a significant impact on an athlete's resilience and ability to perform at their best during challenging competitions. And I 100% mm -hmm. concur with that um, support. Uh, so, well, we all know that support systems are great anyway. You know, we have positive support systems. They help us grow. They help us mature. They help us in so many ways mentally um, to overcome a lot. And I imagine that when we're in certain fields, such as fields that are um, celebrity status, that support system means a lot, right? Um, when you're in a celebrity status, such as athletes, elite athletes, and um, performers and artists and things of that sort, right? There's only so many you can depend on because you're so high up, I imagine, that 
you know, you have to be on guard and that trust comes into play. But when you have people around you in your circle that you can trust, that means a lot. And your following fans are important because they follow you. They invest in you. They invest time and money in you. So you right. um, don't want to disappoint them either, right? So it's that responsibility to keep your fans and your following happy too. So when you get sick or when you're uh, dealing with a mental health crisis, um, you bottle it up because you don't want to let people down, right? So that's where the support come in. You know, let them know that you're there for them. You're there to be supportive and you will support them no matter what. Take self-care. Take your time and get yourself together because you'll be more functional and be, um, more able to um, perform yeah. the job that's, if you're those are great, okay. Great, if you're great safe. words, Leslie. And, and for me, in, in closing, it's it's about simplicity. You don't have to be complicated in your support. It could be as simple as a mom taking care of his chickens while he's playing football. You know, Von yeah. Miller loves chickens, loves to raise chickens, and he was oh so concerned. Well, his mom, she's been there for him from day one. Or the, the mom at college who wanted to make sure that good luck charms in a certain way the bag was packed on overnight trips. Well, she didn't get any any play with the – head coach. So she asked me to go to the equipment manager and see if she could help pack her son's bag so that he got what would make him feel good about himself. And it, it avoided anxiety and it, it increased his uh, response time and his performance on the field. So it doesn't have to be complicated or too sophisticated to be extremely impactful and beneficial to the overall performance and quality of life of the individual. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wayne, no, I just think that, again, comments? this is a great topic. I, I think that, uh, you know, just again, just asking some questions and, and bringing up some, some, some great ideas and just giving a person, people, an uh, inside look at, at, at how things, why things happen the way they happen, how things happen, and what things that we can do to help support the because what we want we want to be supportive right we want to create the support system for for the people that we watch on television that we idolize and we uh, who are entertaining us not just those people but people in our lives as well we want to we want to be conscious of creating some great support systems because we want a support system for ourselves as well so that's what it basically boils down to like so and i and that's love that that we're bringing awareness to all of these type of things so, so to continue to create help create great support systems Absolutely. And I'm um, coach, I'm hoping that you can bring somebody on here yeah. as a guest to kind yeah, of it was a, it was a scheduling issue. You know, the athletes are a lot of things going on right oh, now. Oh yeah. I, I've got my female golfer. Um she couldn't make it. She's preparing for a tournament, but in I think next week she might be able to be on, um if that's if that's open. But yeah, we've we'll mm -hmm. we'll make it happen. We'll make it happen. Yeah. We because I think that it, it you know, it's a good idea to have, you know, guests come on and talk about their experiences to kind of validate and normalize, you know, the experiences. It's one thing for us talking about it, but it's another thing for people to um, disclose and talk about their experiences themselves, right? Um, it is open. So if you can, you have someone for next week, that will be a perfect opportunity. The week after next, we're going to have a special guest on, an author um, that's going to come on and uh, talk about uh, his book and talk about his personal experiences with mental illness and recovery yeah. as well so that's going to be great before you let everybody so, um, go give a link to how people can subscribe to the magazine yes absolutely and wayne can you type it on in mental health talk that live gotcha. for me yes please subscribe to the magazine we've had um, a lot of people subscribing um purchasing our subscriptions the subscriptions are purchable now is that a word purchable <laughs> there you go if it is i just made it up but uh, <laughs> if you go online to www.mentalhealthtalk.live, you can purchase a subscription. Um, next magazine that's about to come out in a few weeks, um, Allison Williams, R&B uh, soloist, um, artist, performing artist, is going to talk about her, um, uh, talk about mental health advocacy and her um, experiences with mental health and mental illness and she's going to talk about she and um was close yeah. with phyllis hyman the late phyllis hyman who we know is suicide she's going to talk about her experience with that and the day phyllis uh killed herself and if you um, want to know about more sports that. there's articles so, written by yours truly in the mag so check it out yeah, uh, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. It's um, we have a lot of um, uh, great topics in the magazine. It's wonderful. It's relatable. It's understandable. Um, and um, we have a lot of several many awesome writers, diverse writers that are um, pulling from you know uh, they have diverse backgrounds and. So if you guys can check it out, if you haven't already, please purchase your copy. I have other books on the um, website as well, such as Mindfulness Meditation for Beginners, Anxiety for Kids, and I added some more books. Um, those books are back on there. Those books keep selling out. The Anxiety for Kids and Mindfulness Meditation keeps um, selling out, but I replenished it. They're um, back on there. So we have several copies. So go get your copies, get the copy of the magazine, purchase a subscription. The subscriptions are on sale right now. So get them while they're on sale because once the magazine comes out next um, uh, in a few weeks next month, then the sale is gonna. Mm -hmm. um, it's not gonna. Be you not guys gonna sell anymore. have a great day. Yeah. See yes. you. Great topic. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Great topic. All right. Bye.